Tonight, our topic is dog park etiquette. So dog parks. Well, ideally, dog parks are a great place to bring our dogs, right? They're safe, they're controlled, our dogs can be off leash, they can exercise, socialize, and play, and ideally, all the owners are attentive and well-educated about their dog's behavior, right? Well, sometimes, yes, but in more more often, the reality is that the dog parks are used by all sorts of dogs and people that are engaging in a very wide range of behaviors, which may or may not be the ideal that you're looking for. So why do we choose to go to dog parks? Well, number one, they're often fenced in and secure, which is, of course, very important for our dogs. They provide a great outlet for physical exercise. They're wonderful for socialization. The problem with that is that we get both social dogs unsocialized dogs, and unsocial dogs, which is an important distinction. The potential is that the owners bringing their dogs in will expect that their dogs will learn to be social, um, other dogs may teach them to do that, or will put them in their place if their behavior is inappropriate. Now, this may work for some dogs, but it may not work for others. And the goal of many owners is to expose their dogs to other dogs, play styles, and of course, different types of people as well. Some of the advantages of a dog park is it is a great place for dogs to form companion um, friendships and build companionship with other dogs. They can learn from role models if there are good dog role models there to learn from, but of course they may also not learn from great role models. They get human socialization, which is so important. They can meet a wider range of people than you may have in your home or even in your neighborhood. They do get that physical exercise. And the parks themselves are mentally stimulating. Your dog is socializing with all sorts of individuals. They have, they're sniffing so many different things and it's just a new environment in general, which means there's a lot of information for them to pick up. But of course, there are disadvantages as well. They may have interactions with dogs that are poorly socialized or may not be social dogs in general. This may lead to bullying or fights. Um, and those may result in severe behavioral issues that can come up, and in some cases, serious or fatal injuries in the case of a dog fight. Another big disadvantage is you may find owners who aren't very attentive, both to their dog's behavior or just to their dogs in general. You may find owners who aren't very well educated about dog body language. They may not know what to look for before things go south. They may not know much about dog behavior in general or about appropriate training methods for interacting with dogs. You may also find owners who have a dogs will fight mentality or who may be combative if you attempt to um, set the dogs up for a better situation if they're not getting on terribly well or if we're seeing some, some not great behaviors between your dog and someone else's dog. You may find owners who take offense at that and don't always respond appropriately. So how do we do this appropriately? How do we do dog parks right? Well, education is going to be key. We want to make sure that when you leave here tonight, you have many more tools to recognize dog body language and the behavioral cues they may use at a dog park. We want you to learn how to stay alert and be attentive to your dog and always have eyes and ears on them. And we want you to understand how training can make a difference in how they behave at the dog park. So let's start with a run through dog body language and communication. First of all, dogs use their entire bodies to communicate. It's not just one piece. And we'll talk about all of them. But there's the body itself in general. And if you look at this graphic on the right-hand side, you're going to see a whole bunch of different body positions. Not one of these dogs is in the same position, and they're all communicating very similar things in some ways. They're all different types of stress signals or calming signals. Um, and we'll talk about what some of these mean. But those postures alone give us a lot of information. So do their facial expressions. Dogs are very expressive with their faces, and we'll discuss the details of, of that in just a moment. Their ears as well give us a lot of information. Their breathing rate can tell us a lot about what's going on, as can their fur itself. If you've ever seen a dog with a mohawk on their back, or what we call the hackles going up, that is called piloerection, which means the hair is standing upright. And of course, their tail. So hands up, you guys. Use that, that thumbs up emoji. Happy, or happy dog wagging their tail, right? Yeah, a little bit. Actually, not necessarily. In a lot of cases, a tail wag can indicate, well, actually a very wide range of behaviors. Tail wags can be anything from a super happy dog to a super, super stressed out who may be at a point where they feel like they need to defend themselves. So tail wags indicate a huge range of information and we'll discuss some of that as we go through. And I will send you guys a copy of this graphic for you to have as well. 
So let's start with relaxed dogs. What do relaxed dogs look like as far as their face? Well, first off, you'll usually see a nice open mouth. You might see eyes that are soft and squinty. Their ears will be up, but not necessarily forward or back. They're kind of just up in a normal, kind of neutral position, or their ear tips might be flopped over, but they're kind of just up and you know, interested. Their head might be tilted to the side or just held neutrally. And you might see their bottom teeth, like in these images where their mouth is open, but nice and soft, their tongue hanging out. You can see those bottom teeth. As for their bodies and their body posturing, their fur will be flat against their body. There's no pilo erection. Their body's usually nice and loose and curved or wiggly. You'll often hear me talk about C shapes in dogs if you um, have ever joined us for a puppy play group session. But that C shape in, in the dog's body tells you um, what they're looking for in their interactions. If you look at these two dogs, look at that kind of beige colored dog. His body is curved towards that shepherd. He's saying, hey, come chase me, come play with me. That's a great indicator that he's inviting an interaction. And if you look at that shepherd mix, his body is also kind of curved in saying, all right, let's go, let's do this. So look for curves towards other dogs. Um, and of course, those big wiggles are great things to look for also, nice loose muscles in their body as well. You'll see their head is held up high because they're interested and they're engaged. You'll often see their tail is either at the, the height of their body or it might be slightly lowered like in the case of our shepherd mix there. If their tail is up, it's usually in a full wag, like you see with that beige colored dog. You also might see play bows, and I'll show you an example of that in just a moment. That white dog in the lower left hand corner, that's a play bow. It's basically that downward dog position. If you do yoga, the front is down, the back is up, and it's saying, hey, let's go, let's play. And it's a great indicator um, that one dog will give another saying, hey, let's do this, let's have some fun. Now, all of the dogs that you see here are nice, relaxed, happy, um, you know, well-socialized dogs from the look of it. We see lots of nice, soft um, body language in their mouths, in their eyes, their muscles. You know, look at those two in the top left-hand corner. We have someone who's running excitedly. Those ears are just flopping all over the place. You have someone who's standing with his mouth open, looking very relaxed and just very content with the world around him. That's what you want to see at the park. And you'll see all different types of dogs here. So their ears may be different, their body language might be a bit different, um, but you're still seeing very similar shapes and softness in all of their bodies. Now let's move into a different category. Let's talk about stress dogs. You can already probably see some pretty big differences between these dogs and the one from the other screen. With their facial expressions, you'll probably see their ears, like these two dogs here, are pressed further back. Their brows are gonna be furrowed. You might see a wider eye, or in that dog on the top right, you see the whites of the eye. We call that a whale eye. You might see their nose, um, lips or eyes are flushed a bit pink. It's because they, they are flushed, they're blushing. There's, uh, there's blood rushing to those sensitive areas, that skin. You might see them panting a bit more, licking their lips, like again, that top dog is, yawning like our lower dog is, or with their mouth closed and a bit tighter. Those are all good facial um, expressions that indicate a dog is a bit more stressed. You'll also see more tension just in the muscles of the face in general outside of the brow. <laughs> so again, that was flushing in a dog who was stressed. You saw lots of pink around the eyes and around the nose. Okay. So as far as body language, you'll see their body is usually tucked in a bit more. Look at this dog on the right. He's kind of pulling back into himself. He's not very comfortable. He's not cowering, but he's definitely pulled back. Um, you may see their tail may also be tucked under their bodies or raised a bit straighter and up above their back. You'll usually see that pilo erection. Their hackles might be going up. Their bodies are much more stiff, like again, you can see in this dog here. They might start hiding under things. You might see behaviors like shaking it off. You've probably heard me talk about that again if you've been to our puppy socialization sessions back before March. Um, that shake it off behavior, it's not just a Taylor Swift song. It is, in fact, your dog shaking off excess um, excitement or excess stress. That's a really good indicator of where your dog is at. You might see them pacing back and forth, kind of like a nervous fidgety behavior. Um, they might shift their weight backwards, like again, you can see in this picture here. You might see excessive jumping or kind of 
harassing the owner for lack of a better term, they might be really insistent on getting your attention. Um, it's your dog trying to say, hey, I need help. I need to get away from something. Any fidgety types of behaviors are generally good indicators your dog is a bit stressed. They may also be avoidant. If they're avoiding people, avoiding dogs, not making eye contact, not approaching, those can also be good indicators of a stressed dog. So here are some examples, additional examples of stressed dog body language. And we saw some of these same dogs a couple of slides ago. Um, and you can see now how different their body language is. Their muscles are more tight. They aren't as loose or wiggly. Look in the lower left-hand corner. Look at that mouth that's in a straight line the um, commissures, which is that curve where the top and the lower lips meet at the, um, the edge of the mouth, that's a bit tighter. You can see there's more tension in the face, the ears are a bit back, the eyes look a bit more concerned is how I would describe that. Um, his paw is raised in front, that's another small stress signal. So look for some of those indicators. The three dogs in the picture um, in the middle there, that dog in the front, he's kind of got, he's moving away, but he's got his head kind of tucked down a little bit. His tail is kind of straight up. His ears are back. His mouth, again, is in that straight line. It's closed. He's kind of saying, oh gosh, I want to get away from this dog. Um, dog who's chasing him looks a bit more, uh, a bit less stressed than he does, but he looks like he's really intent on chasing him, which of course could be stressful for the dog who's being pursued. So look at some of these signals. Top left, we have two dogs, one who is more forward with a, it's hard to see, but a little bit of pile of erection along his back. He's more forward leaning in. And the dog is saying, whoa, this is a bit intense and kind of pushing his weight backwards. Tail is tucked down, ears are back, head is pulled back. He's like, whoa, this is a bit intense. And again, you can see a bit of pile of erection up nigh his shoulders as well. So these are all very stressed dogs. <laughs> So many stress signals, you guys. We were looking away. We weren't making eye contact. Our ears are back. We're licking our lips. Um, our eyes are kind of jumping all over the place. That's a pretty stressed pup right there. And a lot of those small signals, if you didn't know they were stress signals, some of those might be really easy to miss. So when your dog is at a dog park and you aren't right there next to them, um, these can be harder to see. So knowing what they look like, both up close and at more of a distance, is a really, really good skill to start developing. That way, if you do start seeing some of these signals, like the ears are more obvious, then maybe their eye contact will be or their furrowed brow will be at a distance. So start looking for some of those signals that your dogs may present and be aware um, of what you have the best chance of seeing at a greater distance in a dog park. So what about potentially harmful dogs? These are dogs who have been stressed to the point where they may start displaying more offensive or defensive, um, defensively aggressive behaviors. As far as their faces go, you may see their ears either perked up and pointed forward towards whatever's coming towards them, or they may be very flat against the head, like in this example here. You will very often see very wide staring eyes and dilated pupils, like again, you can see in this picture. Now, this dog's mouth is, is closed as much as it can be, except for the fact that he's growling and baring his teeth. So these teeth that we're seeing are very different from the teeth that we saw in those relaxed dogs. You know, not, we're really seeing all those teeth. Even though the tongue is out, we can still see some of those lower teeth as well. This is a very uncomfortable dog. His weight is shifted backward, which we'll get to in a second. But just look at that face. Everything about that face is tight and pulled back and stressed and saying, get away from me, do not approach. So as far as body language, again, we're gonna see them freeze or get very stiff. Any really stiff body language in a dog is not a great indicator. Um, you'll often see their spine gets very, very straight. They may square themselves off, which may mean they, that they lift their chest and kind of just make themselves as, as big and broad as they can. They may be hypervigilant, really tracking something very closely. You may also see some of this in dogs with um, a very high prey drive, which in some cases at a dog park can become problematic. So kind of just be aware of what that behavior looks like if you have a dog who does seem to have more of a high prey drive. You may see a very raised and stiff tail. So again, in this picture, you can tell he's not wagging that tail. <laughs> it's up, but you can tell he's not wagging it. Um, you may also see the opposite of that where the tail is flat by the rear legs. It's not tucked, it's not moving, it's just pointing straight down. And the differences that you see here between the tail being raised and the tail being flat down is usually between offensive and defensive. Um, dogs, who are, as far as aggressive behaviors go, if they are more forward, it's more likely to be offensive, 
aggressive behaviors that you'll see follow that. If it's more down, they're saying, I don't want a conflict, but I will engage in it if you keep pushing me. That's more defensive. So be aware of some of those significant differences in their body language. So here are some more examples of some um, potentially harmful dogs. And you'll see, we saw in the lower right, we saw this dog earlier in our stress dogs. So some dogs can go from stressed to potentially harmful quickly if you um, ignore stress signals and keep pushing. So even a dog who's saying, hey, I'm uncomfortable with this can escalate very fast in some situations. The other three here are telling us very, very clearly, hey, back off, things are not gonna go well if you keep approaching. And again, even with different types of dogs, you can still see those signals very clearly amongst all three. All right, so let's talk about what behaviors we want to look for at the dog park. So what we call green light off-leash play behaviors are ones that are appropriate. So this includes self-interruption or pauses in play. I like to call these check-ins. It's when both dogs pause for just a moment. It could literally be half a second, but they pause, make eye contact, and say, hey, are we good to keep playing? Those are wonderful. It means that they are just double checking to make sure the, the individual they're interacting with wants to keep interacting. These two dogs that you see on the screen here are having a check-in. My bet would be that one was chasing the other and that the Aussie got down the ground and said, hey, you wanna keep going? And the golden doodle said, yeah, let's go. But that's an example of a check-in. Um, and again, these could be very, very brief. They could be a couple seconds, but self-interruption is great. Pauses are also really, really good for dogs when they're playing. Taking breaks are so important for dogs. It means that you're less likely to see their energy levels spike or escalate to the point where they get over aroused and overexcited, which can of course lead to um, unwanted behaviors or less appropriate behaviors. So those breaks in play are great. You may see them take a break, take a moment to cool themselves down and then come back to the play, but you definitely wanna look for self-interruption and those check-ins. Um, shared physical space. Are they comfortable being right near each other? Are they comfortable, um, you know, being near each other around people? Just are they comfortable being right up close? Are they mirroring each other? We call them tandem or mirrored movements when both dogs are kind of moving in the same way, making the same shapes with their bodies. Um, you know, I do this, you do this. Very similar types of movements between the individuals. That's called tandem or mirrored play. We love that sort of thing. It means they're reading each other very well and paying attention to each other. Um, role reversals in play. So that means that you chase me and then I chase you. Now, many dogs are comfortable doing that. Some dogs are not. Some dogs definitely prefer to be the one doing the chasing or being chased, and that's fine as long as both dogs are comfortable with that setup. If you see that one dog is tiring of a role and they are no longer looking as interested in the play, that's a great time to give them a break if they haven't taken one on their own. But role reversals are great. And another really great green light behavior is the ability to change what they're doing based on the size, strength, and play, play uh, style of the other dogs they're interacting with. Many dogs are not one size fits all players. So we wanna make sure that our dogs are able to interact with different individuals at the level that they're looking to interact. So those are great things to look for in dog play. So you can see some really nice examples of it here. Um, we're seeing again those two dogs in the right hand corner that are kind of mirroring each other. They're both kind of curved in and both off the ground in the same way. We see the same type of thing with these two puppies in the middle of the screen, the little fluffy one and the little Vishla puppy. Again, very mirrored tandem behaviors are both chewing on the other one's foot. They're both laying on the ground curved in towards each other. The two next to them, the shepherd and the white dog are running in tandem with each other. And even though his ears are back, look at how loose the rest of his body is. So you can see not just one signal will give you the answer to what's going on. Look at the entire picture. Ears being back isn't enough to say we're stressed. They're just floppy ears going in the wind. Um, we see down below those two images, we see one puppy who's play bowing and inviting a much larger, two much larger puppies to play with him. Um, that's a great indicator of him saying, hey, you're bigger than me, but I'm still comfortable. I still want to interact. And they're approaching very appropriately. Um, they're not moving too big or crouching down like in, um, I want to come get you mode, so that's great. We see that the dog's in the lower right-hand corner. Even though one is on top of the other, he doesn't have his body over him. He's not really pressing or holding him down. The dog who's being, I guess, held 
somewhat to the ground. He's being held down loosely and he's got a paw up at the other dog. So if he wants to push him away, he can. He's not being forced to remain on the ground. His body is super loose and you can see that just because there's no real, real solid muscle definition beyond what you would naturally see with that really um, short coat. And same thing with the dogs on the far left. Even though one is jumping up on the other, they both have loose bodies. They're not really strong grips. The faces aren't tight. The bodies aren't tight. And they both look pretty comfortable with those interactions. So those are all great examples of green light play behaviors. Pause that for a moment. One of the things I loved about that last video was, do you see how when the little Shih Tzu dog jumped over the, I guess, Chihuahua type, we that the that dog was really careful not to put its weight on the other dog. It was really intentional. Whoops, I don't want to hurt you, um, or you know, stress you. That was a beautiful interaction. So many check-ins there. So many role reversals. You saw all the notes down below, but beautiful, beautiful interaction there. Here's another one. Okay, okay, so again, really nice example there, that um, white lab type thing took a nice break, said, okay, give me a second to go sniff, walked around, sniffed for a second, and came right back and said, okay, let's run again and play together. Really nice interruptions there, really nice break taking, um, and just really beautiful play behaviors. So what happens when things start to escalate or get a bit more stressful? These are our yellow, yellow light off-leash play behaviors. These are accompanied by a rise in intensity or just arousal, overexcitement. You might see um, erection begin to happen, that hackles going up. You might see them snarling or exposing your teeth a bit more. And you'll see harder physical contact. They're doing more body slamming or kind of like hard rushes into each other, pinning each other down with a bit more force. You might see them um, briefly freezing or their eyes getting wider and seeing some of that whale eye where the whites of their eyes are visible. You might see them tucking their tails or running for cover a bit more. Um, you might see one dog place their paw on another dog's back and kind of hold it there for a moment. That may be a way of saying, hey, I'm in charge right now, or kind of taking control of an interaction. Now, some of those things dogs don't mind, and some of those things might be okay, but they can, for some other dogs, lead to more stressful interactions. So if you're seeing an occasional paw on the back, but that's really all that you're seeing from this list, that might be fine. If you're seeing multiple things on this list, I would say that's a good time to start really watching the dogs and maybe thinking about giving them a break or an interruption if they aren't taking one on their own. You can see in the picture here, our um, dog at the back, his hackles are up, you can see that hair on the back, really, really high mohawk there. You can see the body is a bit stiffer and he's jumping into that dog with a good bit of force. I mean, look at how much he's launching himself um, towards that dog. And you can see that white dog is really not interested. Our ears are flat, our body is stiff, our paw is not just raised because we're stepping forward, it's raised because we're like, hey, what are you about to do? Um, his head's kind of tilted back. His, again, his face looks a lot stiffer, his mouth is open. He's probably saying, hey, there's probably a vocalization happening there, but he's not very comfortable. So this is an example of yellow light play. And here are some more examples. So we're gonna go, um, kind of counterclockwise here, we'll start on the left. So we have one puppy who is being tag teamed. You can see um, on that little golden puppy, we have some whale eye going on. And the other puppies aren't trying to be inappropriate with their prey, but our puppy in the middle is getting a bit overwhelmed. So even if they're trying to have good interactions, it's not gonna start to feel good for the one in the middle. So we would wanna interrupt something like that pretty quickly just to make sure it doesn't escalate in a way that's uncomfortable for that dog. Now again, you've seen this one down here on the lower left. These two dogs are having an interaction that's not going terribly well. 
maybe they've just met and they're not really so sure if the way they're meeting is comfortable for them. Maybe they've been playing for a bit and they kind of need a bit of a break. Um, hard to say just from one image, of course, but these dogs aren't terribly comfortable. I would want to interrupt that pretty quickly. Now, these two in the middle here, we have our white, I don't know, ears up thing, and we have our, um, our black and white dog in the, in the pool. Look at the dog who's in the pool, and look at the white dog. They both have some whale eye going on. The one who's in the pool is saying, hey, are you coming at me? I'm not sure how I feel about this. And the one who's approaching is like, whoa, you look pretty stressed out. I'm not sure if I want to be part of this. So they're, the context for this picture is they were not very interested in sharing that kiddie pool, and they were expressing that with their body language. We have another tag team type um, situation happening here on the lower right. Our puppy that you saw in the earlier, or the other picture that um, was play bowing is actually meeting these dogs earlier in the play session. He's not quite sure how he feels about being the small dog amongst a bunch of big dogs yet. So he's a little bit uncertain. Now, as you saw from the picture you saw a couple of slides ago, he did get comfortable. But initially he was like, wait, you're bigger than me. You're on either side of me. Where are we going? What are we doing? You're following me. He's not quite sure about that yet. So breaks helped him realize, okay, you're not going to be putting too much pressure on me and this will be an okay interaction. And if you look at those two puppies around him, neither of them are, again, acting in ways that are inappropriate. They're both curved towards him saying, hey, do you want to interact? You can see those tails are actively wagging. But that smaller puppy isn't quite sure about it yet. So again, that would be an example of yellow light play, even though the two who are trying to initiate <clears throat> aren't necessarily being inappropriate by themselves. Now, top right, we do see some play that is inappropriate from um, the two main dogs in that picture, the beige one and the black one. Um, the black dog has a very tight mouth. You can see some of those lower teeth exposed. The ears are forward, but the eyes are very wide and staring. Pupils are dilated. And of course, in the beige dog, we see that whale eye again. We see the ears are kind of flying all over the place. Face is very tight. Mouth is in a hard line. Body is tight. He's trying to get away. You can see um, he's kind of just looking back as much as he needs to, to know where that dog is, but he's looking to get away <clears throat> from that situation. So let's look at some examples of this. Um, we're gonna start with some stills. So we see on the left here, this dog in the front is being chased by the other two and he's looking for somewhere to hide. You can see how his body is stiff as he's running away. His tail is kind of straight down. His ears are back, his mouth is in a hard line, his muscles are tight, and he's trying to get underneath that chair. You can see his head ducks down as he tries to get in there again, tails even straighter down towards his back, and he just wants to get away. The dog who's chasing him, the tail's up, he's really aroused, he's really excited. You can see the tail's up still here. He wants to play, he wants to interact, but he's not doing it in an appropriate way, nor is he being respectful of that first dog's signals. It looks like this guy kind of gives up, which is nice. Now over here, we're seeing um, another situation that's very similar. The dog in front is being chased. We saw this picture earlier. He does not want to be chased by the other dog. And you can see the other dog goes in to do a sniff and, and an interaction, and he just is super, super stressed out by that. Face is super tight. We see whale eye, even in this fast-moving kind of distant picture. Um, you know, tail is up, but it's not, it's not a comfortable up, and the body is just super tight. You can see again, mouth is in a very tight line. So one thing I want to point out that happened there, you see how that dog's collar came off at the end? That's super stressful. If you guys are going to the dog park, make sure what your dog is wearing is going to stay on their bodies because that can become a dangerous situation. Um, the owner was, a, or at least the person who intervened, was able to um, control that dog by, by grabbing the collar, which isn't always the ideal thing to do. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, that collar did come off, which removed one of the ways they were able to get that dog away from that situation and break up that confrontation. You can see with that confrontation, I'll play it for you again because it happened kind of quickly. Um, we saw a shake it off. We saw the smaller dog, um, you know, very clearly say, hey, back off, leave me alone. And we saw other dogs when the commotion started ran in to see what was going on. So let's watch that again. So 
So again, you can see the collar came off right there at the end when the dog shook his head away. Um, but that's not something that we want our dogs to get into at the park. So likely there were lots of signals leading up to that confrontation. Um, and we'll see some other examples of what, how these things build. But those are some of those stress signals that you saw um, and obviously some red light play behaviors. So this is the same dogs from earlier. It was briefly a paw on the back. Okay, so these are all warnings that are gonna lead up to a fight. So you saw kind of earlier there, that smaller dog, again, kind of staying underneath the bench, not really wanting to interact with those bigger dogs. And let's watch what happens. So I'm gonna pause that. I'm not sure if you guys saw it, but the smaller dog was licking his lips. When the beige dog approached him, kind of flicked his head to the side, saying, hey, back off. That's a small signal, but it's him saying, you know, move away from me. And these two bigger dogs, their body is loose, um, but they are hovering around. They're clearly waiting for this dog to come out, and no one's really intervening here. The smaller dog does not want to interact and um, is giving them signals, but the other dogs aren't listening to it, and the owners aren't paying attention to it. A bit jumpy there. So again, that smaller dog, um, I, I know the video is a little bit grainy. He's panting a little bit. His tongue is out. His mouth is open. He's again not comfortable. And he's basically staying underneath that bench. He does not want to interact with the other dogs that are around him. And the fact that no one is kind of recognizing that and giving him that space, giving him that break, is going to lead up to unwanted interactions. So let's talk about some red light off-leash play behavior. So those are all yellow so far. So red light behaviors include relentless, un un uninterrupted play. If someone is not getting a break, if they're always being driven or pushed, um, again, relentlessly, that's not great. Orientation to the other dog's neck or throat. Dogs like to grab around the face of the neck because the skin is looser, but there's a difference between that um, occasional grabbing and dogs who are always focused on that area or who are grabbing it very relentlessly, especially if they are holding dogs down that way, um, if they are doing any sort of shaking, or if they are um, really focusing on that, like in a, in a more intense, um, intense way. So if you're seeing any of those kind of stiffer bodies, um, you know, more alert, like more focused eye contact, if you're seeing you know, grabbing towards the neck with loose body language, that's one thing. But once they start showing stress signals and they're orienting towards the neck or throat, you want to start being very wary of that behavior. Any full mouth biting. Dogs use their mouths like we use our hands. They do a lot of mouthing when they're playing, but full mouth biting is a bit different. When you see them using any pressure or, again, any stress signals like their ears being forward or in the middle of intense chasing or hard physical contact, those are all times when open mouth biting and full mouth biting are a bit more worrisome and we want to interrupt that quickly, especially if you are seeing multiple dogs chasing one dog and you're still seeing lots of open mouth behaviors, you want to interrupt that. Um, and targeting, which is kind of what you saw in that earlier video a moment ago. You saw two dogs targeting a smaller dog. So again, those were yellow signals leading up to a red. So again, we are targeting, the dogs orienting towards the neck. smaller dog is trying to interact. Um, he was approaching. He's like, hey, I, I'd be interested in hanging out with you. He offered some um, peacemaking lip licks, and he was trying to interact, but the other dog wasn't behaving appropriately towards that smaller dog, 
and there was potential for that to escalate into a more dangerous situation. Um, the smaller dog luckily was taking breaks and walking away, but again, that sort of behavior can escalate into ones that you don't want to see, but that's what neck orientation looks like. So again, we see you targeting on the neck again. And one thing I want to point out, these two dogs are trying to play. You see the black dog is very strongly curving towards the white dog. We see him leaning his body in, but the white dog is not behaving in ways that are super appropriate. So much harder physical contact on that. Grabbing at the neck. He's that beige dog trying to get away a bit more there. And a really intense play without a lot of breaks from that white dog there. There we are. Okay, so again, you saw really intense behavior from that white dog, um, you know, not giving the cream dog, who is bigger than the white dog, a space to get up off the ground. The other two dogs that were around them slowed down quite a lot, kind of just stood there, kind of waiting to see what was going to happen. They luckily didn't jump into that play. Um, but even having other dogs around could escalate that situation faster or make the escalation more intense because the dog may feel more crowded. And as you can see, when that cream dog did get up again, he started running with the black dog, and they were both giving more space. They were both curved into each other more and mirroring their behaviors. So we're going to go back to these dogs that we saw earlier and look at some red flags for potential fights. So you're going to see a few things. You'll see dogs sticking by the owner, like we saw before, with that smaller dog hiding under the bench, trying to get away from the other dogs. Um, you'll see him darting out from the owner towards other dogs and returning. Again, hanging out under park benches. Um, dogs who obsess over toys. You're not going to see that in this video, but that is always something to watch for. Some dogs do great with toys at the dog park. Some dogs do not. If you bring your dog to a park and there's a dog who's playing kind of by themselves with a toy, they want to be by themselves with that toy. If your dog is approaching that dog, call your dog back. They should not be interacting with that individual. They do not want to share their toys. And if you know that that is your dog, then don't bring them to the park with toys or bring them at a time when there's no one around as best as you can. That way they don't get into interactions that may not go so well for them. You also want to be careful of dogs congregating um, in one spot, you know, big clusters of dogs, or around lots of people. Some dogs will get a bit more um, protective if they're around their people, around their families. So kind of be mindful of those things. And we're going to go ahead and watch what some of these interactions look like. Oh, 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 oh,
not very interested. Few specimens, tight mouth. happening there um, but that's something to be aware of if your dog does get or a dog gets over aroused in a park and something is interrupted they may redirect that towards a dog who wasn't part of the original interaction or in this case towards a person so be aware of those things as well so let's go ahead we're going to switch gears a bit and talk about how you come into the dog park safely this is really important you want to be really observant before you enter a dog park watch the owners are they engaging with their dogs frequently? If you watch these videos, if you watch the people at all, most of the people were paying attention to each other and not their dogs. Um, we saw a lot of stress signals from dogs that went completely ignored by owners. So are the owners watching their dogs? Are they paying attention to what's happening? Um, what are the dogs doing? Are they taking turns chasing each other or is one individual kind of calling all the shots? Um, what happens you know, with the dog's interactions themselves? Are they, are they disengaging? Are they taking those breaks? Are they checking in with their owners? Or are they kind of just running amok, doing their own thing the entire time? Um, look for dogs that are being picked on. Are dogs being targeted? Um, you know, is it one dog who's always being chased? Or are they kind of all taking turns? So look for some of those signals and make sure that you want to be in this space with your dog before you enter the dog park. Here's an example of entering the catch pen things that you may or may not want to do. Again, you saw a collar come off there. All right, so you saw quite a few notes on that video there, but just to reiterate some of them, as you enter the park, make sure that no one is, en um, is exiting the park as you go to come in. When you enter the pen, that's where you take off your leash and any other training devices that you have. Um, Harnesses are good to take off when they're going to play that way. No one's being dragged around by the harness. Um, if they're wearing, um, you know, collar, I mean, hopefully no one's wearing an e-collar or a prong collar, but if they are, take those things off as well. Um, when you open the gate, immediately close it behind you. That way no one is door dashing to get out of the park. And move away from the entrance of the dog park as quickly as you can. You saw these dogs were crowded by the other dogs that were already in the park when they came in. For some dogs, that can be very overwhelming and not ideal. So you want to move your dog away from the entrance as soon as you can if you're already in the park or call them away before someone else comes in. That's the polite way to do that if you are able to do so. Um, but once you are in the park, especially if you see someone else wants to come in, definitely move away from that entrance area. When your dog is playing at the park, be an advocate. You know, our dog is there to play, but it's our job to be there as our support system. So make sure that if you are seeing your dog is not having interactions that are great, um, that you are able to step in and either give them the breaks they need, 
move them to different parts of the park, or even leave if there are dogs there who simply aren't behaving appropriately towards your dog. Limit your time spent on the phone. There's a great app called Dog Park Assistant by Sue, uh, Sue Sternberg, who if you are interested in dog park videos and really learning some of the nuances of dog behavior, she has a whole bunch of YouTube videos where she basically goes to dog park and records and just play by plays what you're seeing. Um, engage with your dog. Don't just go to the dog park and let them do their thing. Um, interact with them while they're there. Again, when people are entering the park, be polite, call your dog away from the entrance. Move around frequently. Don't spend too much time in one place. That's important. It helps your dog experience different parts of the park, which is good for enrichment. It means that they get to meet different dogs and take more breaks. And it means that they also learn to track you and kind of stay with you. So moving around can be really helpful in a dog park as well. If your dog is checking in with you, reward them. Now, as far as rewards go, keep in mind, some dog parks will ask you not to bring treats with you. So you may need to leave those at home, depending on where you are, but reward them with praise, with affection. Um, if you are able to safely bring a small toy to the park, maybe reward them with a small toy that you hold or play with them with, um, but reward your dog for checking in with you. Trust your instinct. If the interactions that you're seeing at the park don't seem like they're ideal or it seems like you need to take a break, take a break. Um, in some cases, you may choose to leave the park. It really depends on what's going on that day, but breaks are always, always good. Um, taking a break is never a bad idea as far as I'm concerned with your dog's interactions. They will always be beneficial. And keep in mind that interactions can escalate in literally seconds. Um, one thing that I like to look for when dogs are interacting is how a dog is saying, yes, I'm comfortable or no, I'm uncomfortable. If a dog is saying, mm, I don't really want to interact, watch that. Keep in mind that dogs are persistent. So one dog may say, oh, come on, let's play. Oh, come on, let's play. And if the dog who's saying no, it's like, no, 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 and they're saying it pretty consistently, that's probably okay to give a few, you know, a little bit of persistence. That's probably okay, because if the dog is saying no at the same sort of level, then what you might see is they'd say, oh, okay, let's play. But if the dog is saying no, and the level at which they're saying no is escalating, so if they say no, 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 you want to interrupt that. And by the time I see that, that escalation happen, usually I try and get there between one escalation and the second escalation, but sometimes it's between two and three because these things happen very fast. I want to get involved. If my dog is telling another dog, no, I don't want to interact, and they've shown me, no, I really don't want to interact by saying it a second time and a little bit more loudly, that's my cue to get in and support my dog and make sure they, they don't get trapped in an interaction where they aren't being respected and where they have to escalate the level of their saying no. If a dog is always left to figure that stuff out on their own, they're going to start saying no more loudly, more quickly. And that's not what we want. We want our dogs to be able to say no and communicate using the smallest signals they can that other dogs can understand. So if our dog needs some backup, that's okay. That's why we're there. Again, be an advocate for your dog. If um, another dog isn't behaving appropriately, give them a break, jump in there, get involved, call them away, but give them that chance to get out of a situation they may not want to be in. And I have seen things go from fine to a spat or a fight within three to four seconds. So that's why keeping your eyes on your dog um, and really just not using your phone unless you have to is a great idea at the park. Really be actively engaged and involved. One more example, you guys.
So I love that video. I don't know about you guys, but we were primarily following the actions of that brown and white dog. And he was so polite. He was asking for interactions. He was taking turns at role reversals and different types of play. Um, he was inviting dogs to play and then saying, here, come on, you chase me. So there wasn't as much social pressure for them to join him. We saw interactions with all different types of dogs. Um, he did a really beautiful job. Um, I want to go ahead. I know there's a few of us on the call here, but I want to pause for a moment and see if any of you have observations that you wanted to share from watching that video. Does anyone have anything that they noticed that they kind of thought was interesting or they liked? I can play it again if we want. I'm going to play it again. Go ahead and watch it this time and tell me if you see anything that you think is really interesting based on what we talked about tonight. So let's watch it again. And actually, watch that Great Dane there. There's a really cool interaction with the Great Dane. Licks his lips, turns away, invited to play, says, mm, not sure about it, licks his lips and just walks away. And they gave him that space to do that. Beautiful break taking right there. Beautiful, um, respectful responses to those signals. Look at that white dog there that we saw orienting or earlier towards next. He's laying down saying, hey, come on, you want to play? Hey, come on, you want to play? Really respectful there. That was very nice. He's saying, come on, guys, you come get me. No one's pinning him on the ground, which in a cluster like that, that's a really good choice. All right. Anyone have any thoughts or comments? So the little uh, brown and white dog or black and white dog is very rambunctious when he comes in. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, the interesting thing is he doesn't stay with any one dog in for very long. He's making uh, the rounds. Yeah. So, he, yeah, he makes the rounds and then he takes the sort of submissive rolling over thing when it looks like, you know, maybe there's too many dogs around him. Yeah, he's pretty socially savvy. Yeah, and I think when he takes that kind of rolling on his back mode, he's like, hey, come on, guys, who wants to play? He's giving them the invitation to come play with him, come chase him, um, you know, chew on his face, wh wherever he's at. He's saying, hey, I'm comfortable. What do you guys want to do? But he's definitely going around to everyone, like you said, and seeing who wants to play, seeing where everyone's at, and being super respectful of the different signals that he gets in response. Yeah, great. Anyone else? Thank you, Molly. All right. Well, Do you think he knows those dogs? Um, because he greeted them really so willingly that I suspect he, he's met them before. Um, I don't know. I, I was not the person from our behavior team who filmed this video, so that I can't answer. Some dogs are naturally very, very dog savvy. Um, he seems like a dog who, just by judging from this one video, has clearly been to this park before. He doesn't spend any time investigating the space itself. He's all about the dogs. Um, and none of them link right to him. Like He doesn't have a particular buddy that he goes for. So he may not know any of these dogs, but he may be familiar with several of them. It's hard to say, but he was definitely, as you observed, very, very dog savvy. Yeah, good question though. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and keep going, you guys. So let's talk briefly about leaving the dog park. So obviously, look again, for people who are wanting to enter or exit at the same time. When you are going into that exit area, um, assuming there is a double gate at that park, make sure that you enter that catch pen and close the gate again quickly. We don't want anyone following you in there. That is where you put the leash on your dog. That's so important. So many dogs get uncomfortable with interactions on leash that we really don't want them on leash while someone else is off leash. And by the way, speaking of leashes, 
the video that we saw earlier on in the presentation with the dark colored dog who was orienting towards the neck of the smaller dog, he was on a long leash that was probably 15 or 20 feet long. Um, you may see dog owners using that when in the case of that dog, they're uncertain how their dog is going to behave at the park. For a lot of dogs, those aren't a great idea because they might trip other dogs, they might get tangled, um, so and it might make them more wary. So just be very mindful of that. Typically, we recommend not bringing things like that with you um, into the dog park. And again, once you're in that catch pen, leash up and exit that catch pen quickly. Once again, just to make sure that no one comes in behind you. <clears throat> and lastly, things to leave at home. Leave people food at home. That's going to attract far more attention than you want at the dog park. Chairs. Um, you know, as we said earlier, <clears throat> you should be moving around the dog park with your dog and really actively engaged. You want to be able to get up and be with your dog at a moment's notice if you see something starting to move in a direction you don't want it to go. So the moment you're seeing those yellow light behaviors, you want to be really ready to go if you need to interact with your dog or interrupt something that's happening. Leave their favorite toys at home, that way they aren't as likely to be possessive over them. They're less likely to lose them or have someone try to steal them. Again, leave those long lines or those long leashes at home. Leave those really high value rewards like bones and shoes and raw hides. Leave all of those home. And of course, leave your training devices home. The dog park is probably not the place to work on really hardcore training like that if your dog is off leash and looking to socialize. So once again, some of the key concepts. You are at the dog park. You are an advocate for your dog. That is your job while you're there. Always be observing, always be watching the other dogs, watching the other owners, and making sure that your dog is having the best experience they can at that dog park. Be mindful of large groups of dogs. Big clusters of dogs tend to get over aroused and don't always play very well together. So dogs play best usually in pairs. Some dogs can work really well as a group of three, but for the most part, dogs prefer to play in pairs. Um, and build a solid training foundation that can definitely, or that will definitely help you at the dog park to make sure your visit is more successful. Now, this is important because we'll see in a moment, there are some behaviors that happen at the dog park that, well, training definitely comes in handy. Now, as far as training and all that goes, again, experience, prevention, knowing body language, all of those things are important. The more that you know about body language, the more you know about how dogs learn and how to work with them and train them, the easier it will be to prevent things that you don't want happening from happening. Keep in mind your dogs are going to easily learn habits through experience. If they are repeatedly having interactions that they don't want at the park, they're going to learn how they need to react to make those interactions stop the more it often it happens. So again, being an advocate for your dog and helping them build good habits as opposed to unwanted habits will be really important. And remember that practice makes better and consistent practice makes proof. What we mean by that is that the more often your dog practices a behavior, the more fluent or proofed it becomes. So if you're working on something like recall, for example, the more often that you do it, the better they're going to be at it. The more that you practice it in different environments, the better they're going to be at it across those different environments. Keep in mind, of course, that even your trained dogs can face challenges and distractions, especially at a place like the dog park. So really working on that consistency across different environments is going to help them be more successful in those situations, where if you do need to call them away from something, they have a better chance of succeeding. Again, dogs do learn from interactions with other dogs. Dogs are learning all the time, every moment. So we always want to be aware, again, <laughs> redundancy is key, that you are an advocate for your dog. If you see interactions you don't want to see, interrupt that so your dog does not learn things that you may not want them to learn from those interactions. And of course, your dog is your responsibility at all times. Always be watching, always be ready to act, and help your dog out if they need a hand. So you may have guessed, but the most common behavior that we see people struggle with at the dog park is recall. You're gonna watch this woman in the blue trying to recapture her golden doodle, and you are going to see a, you're probably very familiar with it, a game of keep away where she goes to grab him and he says, nah, I'm staying here at the park. So working on a solid recall is a really important behavior to make sure that you start practicing before you go to the dog park and slowly build your way up to working in very high distraction environments like the one that you see here. As a fun little plug in September, we're going to be offering um, our rapid recall class again as part of our training courses. It'll be an online course, but you'll learn all the tools that you need to to deal with situations like this. It'll be taught by our trainer, uh, Stephanie Kennedy, who is wonderful. 
and used to be our coordinator up at our Escondido campus. So she's a pro at this sort of stuff. So again, recall is one of the most challenging behaviors that many owners in, uh, face at the dog park, so definitely one to work on. Being aware of the interactions and behaviors you want to see for polite interactions, both on and off leash. Working on focused behaviors are really great to have at the park for check-ins with you. So teaching your dog to check in at the dog park, teaching them a solid look or focus behavior is a great way to get those, those check-ins even at a distance. And of course, working on your other basics like sit, <clears throat> and leave it and different things like that are also really key behaviors to practice before you go to a dog park. And of course, we have to say it, we have a whole bunch of really cool classes available on our website. And um, actually, the link to that has changed. We will send you an updated link in our follow-up email. But you'll still find it by going to the website, stumaine.org. Under programs, it'll say behavior and training, and that's where you'll find all of our classes. So we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. So I'm going to give you guys a chance to unmute. And if we have anything from the chat, I'll give Brent a chance um, to address those first. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Juliet. That was wonderful. And we are past seven o'clock. So if anyone does need to drop off, we certainly understand. But we've got a couple of questions that have come through the chat. The first one being, what's the safest way to break a confrontation or fight? Yes, thank you for asking. So the safest way to break up a confrontation is going to be to grab the dogs by um, the hips. We call it the wheelbarrow. I'm actually going to pause. Well, no, I guess I'll leave it on. So you're going to grab the dogs right by where the hips meet the waist, and you're going to lift them up like you're playing wheelbarrow, and you're going to move them back. Now, your dogs get their forward propulsion from those back legs. So by lifting up those back legs and pulling them backwards, you're going to kind of take away that ability to propel themselves forward. That said, if they are in the middle of an actual fight and contact has been made where one dog has a bite grip on another, you do not want to do that. Um, instead, what you'll do is if you, if you wheelbarrow them and you just pull backwards and a dog has a, a bite, you actually risk doing more damage because it, it may tear. So if a dog has bit and is gripped on to another dog, you want to actually push the dogs in towards each other because that's going to force them to basically have more than they can hold on to in their mouth. It'll force that jaw to release and then you move them back. So both dogs would push in towards each other and then get pulled away once the dog who has bit has released. So they have not bit, you pick up the hips and you pull them backwards, wheelbarrow style. If, they, if there is a bite in progress that is not releasing, you pick up the legs wheelbarrow style, push in towards each other, and then once they've released, you pull them back again. Um, I will say, if you, if you try to look up videos of this online, there are not many good ones, and there are some downright terrifying <laughs> wheelbarrow videos, so do not trust the internet on this one. Um, we've talked about filming one with our team. We just haven't had a chance to do it yet with everything going on, but but there are ways that you can do it safely and the wheelbarrow method is one of them. So yeah, great question, thank you. Yes, absolutely. And I do wanna mention that I did put that updated link in the chat. So if ah, anyone wants you. to check out the behavior programs. And we also have an ask a trainer function online. We did get a few general questions in the chat that we may not get an, uh, an opportunity to answer tonight, but you are more than welcome to always submit those online via the ask a trainer. So did anyone uh, wanna unmute themselves and have any direct questions related to Juliet's presentation or dog park safety specifically? I could ask questions all night, but um, <laughs> my dog, I, I have a fairly new uh, rescue dog. Um, I've had him for about five months. And he is, again. You do. He, he's hyper vigilant and really does display a lot of that stand up straight and rigid appearance, but he's extremely friendly to other dogs. I mean, sometimes his intensity is too high, um, but is this something I should worry about? I mean, he's never gotten in a fight or done anything terrible, although he does get rough and I do try and break it, break it up when it's, you know, when the intensity ramps up too high. But what, it, what is the risk downstream? He's about a year and a half. Okay, yes, yeah, so he's still a pretty young dog. Um, yeah, it sounds like he kind of, because he's so excited, he's starting a bit of a yellow level almost. What I might recommend is before you go to a dog park or even before you go on a walk in some cases, give him some enrichment to do. So enrichment is different from physical play in that it's mentally stimulating for your dog. So it burns a different type of energy. So imagine going for a run versus doing an escape room. They're totally different types of exhaustion. 
So if we give him some activities that are mentally stimulating before he goes out, it kind of takes off the edge. So he goes in with a bit less oomph. So that can be really helpful. Um, as far as enrichment, that could be puzzle toys. It could be, um, you know, feeding him his meals via puzzles of some sort. It could be scent work. Scent work is wonderful for our dogs to burn energy. Um, I've seen, you know, adolescent dogs, nine months old, do 20 minutes of nose work and then pass out for hours. So it's a phenomenal, phenomenal tool for helping to manage some of those overexcitable behaviors, especially prior to situations that you know get them really riled up. So enrichment is key. Um, we do have a phenomenal nose work trainer who works with us, Jamie Bozy. She does rolling classes, so you can um, try out the basics class either as a single session or as a group of three. But the nose work classes, if you have a dog who likes to sniff, who likes to work, who gets really riled up before they go out exciting places, nose work and other enrichment are phenomenal for those dogs. <clears throat> So yeah, and, and just keep watching. If he's new to your home, it's gonna take him a couple months, like about three months to really start settling in in a I'm comfortable and kick it off my shoes sort of way. So making sure that you start rewarding the behaviors that you want to see, encouraging the behaviors you want to see now, mm -hmm. while he's still yep. figuring out what's appropriate, it's gonna be really important. Okay, thanks. And just one more. The other thing that he does is runs like crazy across the field to, you know, run up to a kid, a bicycle, or another dog on or off leash. Okay. So again, for that, see if the enrichment makes a difference. The other thing might be trying to go somewhere. I know right now that our options are a bit more limited, but trying to go somewhere where it's more fenced in and he may have less access to people on bikes or kids that aren't, aren't at the dog park to be the dog park. So if his behavior is less predictable, going to a smaller, more enclosed space will probably be safer than going to a bigger, more open, accessible to different types of people doing non-dog park things sort of space. So I would say maybe start there and maybe go at quieter times where even with enrichment, you can kind of gauge and make sure he's being appropriate and give him breaks if he needs them. Breaks, breaks, breaks. Always give breaks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. You. Cheryl, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, Sometimes Charlotte, when she encounters a larger dog mm -hmm. and they're like in her face, she gets a little like grumbly and she can even kind of put a little fangs up and stuff. And, yeah. you know, I think she's scared, but generally she does very well with most dogs. She does better with little dogs now because she's so small. But I mean, medium sized dogs, but it's the really large dogs that she tends to, you know, if they're, if they're in her face, she doesn't like that. So what can we yeah. do to help her with that? So uh, if she's saying I'm not comfortable, the best thing you can do to help her out is to give her a little bit more space or before those big dogs approach, just let the owners know like, Hey, she's less comfortable with big dogs and she doesn't like really close in your face interactions. So maybe letting her greet first, where if she wants to initiate an interaction, she can, but she's not forced to have that interaction. And then um, give the other owners a heads up. You're like, if we're gonna say hello, make it really short and sweet, or kind of just directing her away is helpful. But if she's, you know, if she's carrying up a lip and saying, I'm not really interested in this, she's not really interested, and that's totally okay. Um, it's more important to support what she needs than to kind of put her in a situation where she feels like she has to say those things. Another thing to keep in mind is that dogs don't see as well up close as they do at a distance. Um, so when a big dog is right over her or right in her face, that can get super intimidating, especially for a small dog. So if she's clearly saying like, this is a boundary for me, that's okay. That's totally fine. Um, dogs have such strong noses. They're between 100 and 300 million scent receptors. So if she's you know, not looking for those up close interactions, that's fine. Those dogs knew who they were blocks away. So they don't need those up close greetings if we know that with, with certain types of dogs, it's not what she's looking for. If they're a bigger dog and they're a calmer greeter or they give a bit more space, that may be totally fine. But again, just watch her and look for her signals and see where she's at. And I always like dogs who have already shown me they're a bit uncomfortable. I like to give them more of the initiative where it's like, you know, hey, you know, Let's keep your dog there. Let's see if she wants to go up and say hi. And if she does, cool. If not, we'll, we'll just walk her away and that's fine. So if she has a choice of going up, that's usually ideal. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Give her a snuggle for me. <laughs> so Juliet, just being mindful of your time, we'll try mm -hmm. and do maybe one or two more questions here. 
Okay, um, thank you. Our one-year-old puppy licks other dogs' lips when playing. Is this a sign of stress or submission? He looks like he's having fun, but sometimes it gets a little obsessive with bigger dogs. It is a, neither. It is a sign of greeting. So um, if, if you've ever had the, I guess, good fortune to do a wolf interaction, um, they will tell you, the staff will tell you, the wolf is going to lick your lips. Do not be alarmed and do not tell them no because they will be very offended. Um, lick, lip and teeth licking is actually a way for dogs to greet each other. So it's a very polite uh, social greeting from one dog to another. Not all dogs may appreciate it, but it is one that they'll do. So it's one way of greeting and interacting. It's not necessarily submissive or anything like that, but it is a way of interacting. Um, some dogs may do more of it than others. Some dogs may appreciate it less than others. But if he is being a bit excessive with it, just kind of call him away or ask him to do a check-in or something like that and give him a bit of space, especially if the other dog is like, dude, what are you doing in my face? Um, and that should be fine. It's a good question. I hear that one very often. Great. Thank you. And our final question will end on um, everyone's favorite topic. Our six-month-old pup plays with a neighbor dog every night, and she's having soft stools after. Um, so I think the question is, is that directly related to playing? Um, and, or, or what would you, what would your observation be there? So it can be. Um, ex <laughs> excitement poops are usually a bit softer. I know dogs who get, re who get really excited going into new environments, and as a result, they have like Sorry guys, they have diarrhea. They have really soft stool as a result. They're like, oh my God, I can't cope. It's so exciting and they just unload. Um, so a soft stool can be an indicator of just high arousal and overexcitement. Um, as long as you're not seeing it continue past that, then you're probably fine. And I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. If you're ever seeing things in the stool that you don't wanna see like blood or anything else like that, obviously that's a, that's a go to your vet concern. Um, but if it's just happening after play and it's not continuing to other movements beyond that, I think you're probably okay. But I am not a vet, so. That. Thank you for the disclaimer. We appreciate it. So thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. We're going to go ahead and um, end the questions at this time. Juliet just has a few wrap-ups, but if you have any other yeah. questions, please do check out that um, link that we put in the chat for the Ask a Trainer function. Yes, and then I just wanted to let you guys know we do have some really cool upcoming events um, as well as some regular events. We have our pet loss support group, which is a monthly, occur um, I think it's at least monthly occurrence. The next one is August 15th. We have a really cool tour of our wildlife center. It's not a place that we usually do tours, and it's a very busy time of year in the wildlife center, so definitely check that out also on the 15th. Our next pet talk is going to be with our um, behavior and training coordinator from our Oceanside campus, Lindsay Lieberman. And she's going to be talking about how to speak dogs. She'll get a whole lot more body language and different topics like that. It should be a phenomenal talk. And then our Humane at Home events are always super fun. We're doing an adoption event and a Facebook Live on August 21st. So check all of those out. There's more details on our calendar. So definitely take a peek. And thank you once again for joining us tonight. We very much appreciate you hanging out with us. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to reach back out via Ask a Trainer or by emailing behavior at sdhumane.org. And myself or one of our other trainers will get back to you. And hopefully we'll see you in our classes or our puppy socialization chats sometime soon. Thank you guys so much and enjoy the rest of your evening.